All right, well, welcome again, grade 12s. So this is very exciting. A um, couple things. Number one, you don't have a final exam to write, which I know that makes you happy. Actually, that makes me happy too, because uh, with this pandemic and everything, that would have been logistically very hard to do. But also, um, it gives us more chance to cover like the stuff we would have covered, and we don't have to worry about reviewing for an exam or anything like that. But I'm going to give you like an end of year <clears throat> review assignment or review project. It just won't be an exam. Okay, so uh, we'll still, you know, try to finish as much as we can so that, uh, you know, you can take that with the university um, and hopefully be okay for your, for whatever you need for first year and everything. So, all right. So um, as you can see, okay, the next unit is uh, electric fields, it's called, but uh, I mean, I call it the electrostatics unit. And um, we can't do the Isaac Newton contest, so we'll get that off the list right now. That That's finished. Okay, it's canceled this year. Um, but uh, yeah, look, it's quite short, okay? So you'll notice that we would have done this in less than two weeks, okay, this whole thing. We can't do the experiment with charges, so forget that one as well. Okay, so lesson seven, lesson eight are gone. Lesson 10 is just a catch-up day. That leaves us with like five classes, and that's all, okay? Um, and in fact, we're going to kind of cancel, um, sorry, it was six classes, but we're going to cancel a, a lesson one as well. Um, yeah. So anyway, there's really only five lessons. This is it here. And so what I'm kind of hoping is in the next week and a half, we can go through this whole thing and um, maybe have a test in the middle of next week. Okay. Now, there's some new things in here, okay? And uh, some of it's a little weird, but what I think you'll find is if you do the homework and do the practice and stuff, you'll find it's actually very easy, okay? Like, you need to get used to a different kind of problem than the kinds we've been working on so far. But um, yeah, I, I think you'll find not too bad. Um, a little confusing, because some of the concepts are new, but not too bad other than that. All right, so let's get right to it. I'm just going to teach the first lesson. So what I'm going to do is we're going to skip the review. The review is stuff we did in grade 11 and grade 9. Forget that. Uh, let's just move on to the, the sort of new material. And the new material we're going to start with is uh, Coulomb's Law. So we're going to start here with lesson 2. We're going to do that today. And then uh, one lesson is not probably good enough for the week. So I'm probably going to do these two lessons this week or three maybe. Yeah, like I think I'll do these first three lessons and then that'll leave us with just two lessons next week and then we'll have a test. Okay, so that's our plan. All right, so let's get right to it. Static electricity. Not much to say really. If you watch the other video that I posted, you'll know that we have this thing called electron theory. So I'm just going to write that right now in the pretty rainbow color. Electron theory. What does that say? Well, basically, I'm just going to boil it down to one point. Um, it's the movement of electrons Whoop. Okay. Okay, the movement of electrons uh, explaining or explains all electrostatic. Wow. It's hard to write on this today. It's been a while, okay? I'm having a really hard time. Let's try that again. Explains all electrostatic phenomena. All right, so that's electron theory, basically, okay? And what that means is, let's say you rub your feet along the carpet and you're wearing cotton socks, you got a polyethylene carpet or something like that, and you'll notice that you got a charge, an electrostatic charge on your body after that. You touch something like a doorknob and you get a discharge. You can explain all of that by tracking the movements of electrons, okay, in the first case, away from you into the, into the carpet via charging by friction. Now you have a positive charge. And then when you touch the metal doorknob that's grounded, let's say, you that neutral doorknob gives you a shock, transferring electrons back into your body. Okay, so those experiences you have with static electricity can all be explained using the movement of electrons. Okay, and that's that's sort of the essence of ele electron theory. I'm just going to put a few notes in here. I know we're not doing review 
but this is all pretty easy stuff. Um, electrons, okay, they are <coughs> small, or here, light, all right. Light meaning um, the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, true fact. Okay, now that is an extremely tiny number, okay? To give you a sense of how small it is, a proton, which is its positively charged sort of counterpart in the nucleus, is a thousand times bigger than that, okay? And proton is already really small, but it's a thousand times bigger than the electron, okay? Uh, they carry, they might carry a small mass, but they carry lots of charge, okay? So they have a negative charge, electrons, okay? And uh, we'll talk about the value of that charge a little bit later. Actually, you might as well, um, yeah, we'll do it a little bit later. We're supposed to do um, an experiment about that later on, so I'll save that for later. It's not, it doesn't occur in the homework just yet, okay? Uh, they carry a negative charge, okay? And they are easily moved, relatively speaking, depending on the substance, okay? All right, so protons. Protons, on the other hand, are larger. I'm not going to say they're large, but they're larger at least. Um, I think they're 1.6 times 10 to the negative 27. Let me just check that. What's the mass of a proton? 1.6. Wow, I'm so smart. 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27. So it's almost there. 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27. Kilograms, you don't have to memorize any of these numbers, but they're larger particles. They have a positive charge. And in fact, one proton and one electron will neutralize each other. They have the same size charge, even though they're very different particles otherwise, okay? And they are fixed in the nucleus of atoms. Now, I said before that in liquids and gases, positive charges can move around. Yeah, but they that protons don't come out of the nucleus. It's just that the nucleus itself, the atom itself is mobile in a liquid and a gas, right? So ions that are positively charged, like cations in solution, they can move around in the solution. Okay, no problem. Uh, in solids though, positive charge can't move because the protons, the, the atoms themselves are locked in the lattice work of the solid, right? So they're fixed in the salt. They're fixed in the nucleus and they cannot be removed. So they're much more difficult to remove from a solid or to move in a solid protons, that is, okay? So anyway, there's a couple of things there. Um, I'm just gonna say that a neutral object, if it's neutral, what does it mean? That it has no charge? No, it has the same number of electrons and number of protons, right? That has to be true in a neutral object. If it's a positive charge, then the number of electrons is less than the number of protons, right? And if it is a negative charge, okay, then the number of electrons is obviously greater than the number of protons, okay? And uh, that's basically how charge works, okay? Um, a couple of notes before we talk about Coulomb's Law, and that's our, that's our lesson number one for today. A couple of notes about that. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so um, the unit of charge. So before we discovered how much charge an electron carried, or before we even discovered electrons, we had a way of measuring charge that we named after a scientist called, uh, I forget his first name, but I think it was George. But anyway, it was Coulomb, okay, was his last name. Um, so uh, Coulomb, and I mean, the details are, like the definition of a Coulomb is a bit weird, like say it's the amount of, charge flowing out of a one amp source in one second, like that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to use a capital C to represent Coulombs. Okay. And of course, charge can be positive or negative. Okay. We use the variable for charge. We don't use C for charge as a variable. This is the unit for measuring charge. The variable for charge we use is Q. Okay. So Q this equals the charge on an object. Okay, so 
that's so you understand what the formula is all about. All right, so now that we've gotten sort of the basic concepts of static electricity out of the way, like that, that we have positive and negative charge, the electrons are the guys that are easily moved, and that what, that's what explains most electrical effects in solids, especially. Okay, um, the the electrons are negative, the protons are positive. Okay, what makes something neutral, positive, or negative? These are all the basics. Let's now talk about Coulomb's law. Okay, and Coulomb's law will talk will tell you, okay, how you calculate. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Pardon me. Coulomb's law. Uh, this is the relationship between charge, force, and distance. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare this to universal gravitation. And the reason why is because it's extremely similar. Okay. It turns out that those two forces, those two fundamental forces in nature, electricity and gravity, have some similarities, but there are some important differences. Okay, so we'll talk about the similarities and the difference. Okay, and we'll talk about here the electric force, which is Coulomb's law. Okay, so we have on the one hand Newton's law of gravity, right, on this side, and on the other side we have Coulomb's law of electric force. All right, number one. The force of gravity, and we know this already, so I'm going to go through this quickly, is proportional to m1 times m2. Remember that? Universal gravitation? Okay, we should remember it because it hasn't been that long since we looked at that. Well, the electric force is not proportional to uh, mass, okay? It's not mass that creates electric force, it's charge. And it does take two charges to attract, okay? So that is... You see the similarity though, right? It's the product of the two masses on this side, product of the two charges on the other side. Okay, I'll put this line down the middle here. All right, so with the force of gravity, we find that it's inversely proportional to the square of distance between the object centers. Well, with the electric force, we find exactly the same, oh, pardon me, exactly the same thing, that it's proportional to the inverse square of the distance. So that means the further two charged objects get, the weaker the force between them. Okay. Um, all right. So the force of gravity, when we write out the full formula, we introduce a proportionality constant that Newton introduced. Okay. That value was determined accurately to be this number here, where it's a really tiny number, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton times meter squared per kilogram squared, right? Well, the electric force, we introduce a proportionality constant also. Now, I'm going to call it KO, okay? K with a little subscript O. Don't get it confused with the spring constant K. Your, your book just writes K, okay? But this is a different variable altogether, okay? So... It's k q one q two over r squared. Now k with a little sub subscript zero next to it is electric field constant. Okay, and look at the number it has been determined empirically to be nine point zero times ten to the nine newton times meter squared per coulomb squared. Now, uh, let's just take a moment and look at those two proportionality constants. So here's gravity over here, and look how tiny that number is. This is extremely tiny, which means you need a huge, you need your two masses to be, one of them at least, to be huge to make this force measurable. But look at this constant over here. So this is our electric field proportionality constant, Look how huge that number is. Okay, now that number is 9 times 10 to the 9. That is 20 powers of 10 in physics, we'll say orders of magnitude. It's 20 orders of magnitude bigger than the gravitational constant. You know, basically, it's 100 billion billion times stronger. Okay, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and what that means is a really tiny amount of charge 
tiny, tiny, tiny amount of charge. Like when you're just rubbing two things together, you're just producing a really tiny amount of charge there, but you feel it. And the reason why you feel it is because that is a very large, like, you know, but basically electro, electric forces are much, much, much stronger than gravitational forces per unit of charge, right? Okay, so compared to per unit of mass, like two one kilogram masses have such a weak force of interaction a meter apart that you can't feel it at all. Okay, but two one coulomb charge, in fact, electric forces are so strong that the unit of a coulomb is actually like a massive amount of charge, okay? Like you have nine times 10 to the nine newtons if you had two balloons with a coulomb on them each separated by one meter. Nine times 10 to the nine newtons of force in between them. That is enough force, like, that's a lot, that, you know, that's nine billion newtons of force. So it's like the weight of nine billion apples. So the story of that, you know, obviously, is that those balloons never have that much charge. A one Coulomb charge, you would never touch it. Like if the Van de Graaff had one Coulomb of charge on it, it would kill you, okay, to touch it at that voltage that it's sitting at, let's say 100,000 volts or so. Uh, a lightning strike might have, you know, 20 coulombs of charge in it, something like that. Just to give you some sense, coulomb is actually a huge amount of charge, whereas a kilogram of mass, tiny, okay? Now, uh, gravity is a key difference also, is gravity is attractive only, which means Gravity does not repel objects, it only attracts them, right? But we, you know from experience, I'll go back to the rainbow color just to be consistent. You know from experience that this one can be attractive for opposite charges, right? Because opposites attract, but it can be repulsive, oops, Okay, for like charges, okay? And I'm just gonna put a little note in here for you. Note, never, and I say again, ever, okay? And I'm saying this because I know Hala is gonna do it anyway, okay? But never ever, okay? put the sign, oops, of the charge in the formula. Okay, never do that. And I'll, I'll explain why when we do an example. But what you're gonna do is, don't forget like force is a vector, so that's part of the reason why we do this. Um, yes, it'll affect, you'll, you'll end up getting positives and negatives and negative force and so on. And, and, uh, you know, let's do an example and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So what you do here, I'll show you the steps down here. So let's do an example. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, here's an example. Let's say, I'll just do a couple of examples for you. I'll do one from the textbook also. Let's say you have two charges. Okay, so this is Q1, this is Q, okay, let me, this is Q2. Okay, Q1 and Q2, and let's make them separated by 1.5 meters. Now, I'm gonna tell you that Q1 happens to have a charge of 1.6 microcoulombs. Now, get used to this weird metric unit We've seen it before, but not very often in this class. So that means 1.6 times 10 to the negative six coulombs. You will see it, gotta be honest, all the time in the homework. So please pay attention to this unit, okay? Um, why does that come up? It's because when you're rubbing balloons together, that's typically around the magnitude of the charges around a microcoulomb, okay? So anything you're charging by friction usually has small amounts of charge in the range of microcoulombs. So this unit comes up very often, okay? Now over here on this side, what about Q2? Well, let's make Q2 a little bit different. Let's say Q2 has a charge of negative 3.4 microcoulombs. All right, so that's charge 
1 and charge 2. Okay, now the question is simple. The question is, what is the force between these two charges? Okay, now by the way, I'm going to write this negative 3.4 microcoulombs. All right, so there's our example. And my question for you is, I'm going to draw a little free body diagram here of Q1. You don't need, honestly, you don't need to draw a diagram. Sometimes in this unit, you will have to draw them, but not in this question, but let's we'll draw it anyway. Okay, all right, so now I'm going to ask you a uh, sort of rhetorical question here. I'm going to answer it, okay? So I've already mentioned this to you, but one of those charges is positive, and I'm going to emphasize that it's positive. I'm going to go plus. I don't have to write a plus for positive numbers, but I'm going to write it to emphasize it, okay? And one of them is negative. So does that mean they attract or repel? Well, you know the answer. Uh, opposites attract. So Q1 is going to be pulled in that direction by the electric force. Now, if I draw a free body diagram of Q2, it is also attracted to the other one. So it is actually going to be pulled this way. These are This is an action and reaction pair. They're going to be like, you know, Q1 is being pulled, let's say, east, and Q2 is being pulled west, right? But it's the same size force, because that's Newton's third law, right? It's a reaction, there's a reaction. So they're both reacting to each other, pulling towards each other. And if they're free to move, they'll actually move towards each other, of course, okay? All right, so now, if we do this one, we're gonna go K, Q1, K0 here, Q1, Q2, over r squared, like that. Actually, you know what? I should get, I should drop the the o the little o. Some textbooks have it, but yours doesn't. So maybe from now on, I should just write k. As long as you promise me, okay, that you don't think this has anything to do with springs. Okay, there's no springs in this question, and I know we use the same letter. That happens sometimes. Okay. Anyway, um, here's the deal. We know this force, let's say this direction here is east, and this one is being pulled west, right? Okay, so we know how to calculate the size of this force, right? So here, k is 9 times 10 to the 9, it's a constant. 9 times 10 to the 9 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 6 times uh, 3.4 times 10 to the negative 6. Now, uh, the distance between them, the centers, is 1.5 meters squared. That's all you have to do, right? So you're going to need a calculator to do this. Um, <clears throat> but notice that I did not put in, I'm going to put it in rainbow, I did no negative sign. Okay? <clears throat> Why did I do that? It's because if I did it, so watch, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what the answer is. So I'll put my calculator. It's gonna be <clears throat> nine exponent nine times 1.6 exponent six negative times 3.4 exponent six negative uh, divided by 1.5 squared. I get, <coughs> 0 0.022 newtons. Now I know the direction of this is east because I know it's attracted to the other object. But what if I had put a negative sign in there? Well, if you just plug that negative sign into your calculator, then you would have gotten negative 0 0.022 newtons east like this. Okay, now I'm going to erase that in a second. But had I put the negative sign in here, this would have been my answer. But if it's negative east, what direction does that mean? Well, that means west, right? So this implies that this would therefore be west. But it's not west. It's attracted to the other guy, right? And so here's the deal. Okay, when you're doing these things, don't put the sign in, okay? that will confuse the direction of your vectors. So I'm just gonna say a very important note, OK? 
Okay? Very important note. Use the signs to decide the direction of your force ahead of time. Okay, the direction of forces. Okay, based on whether it's attractive or repulsive, right? It's a pretty easy decision to make. <clears throat> so that's why they have to tell you the sign. They have to tell you the sign so that you know which way the force is. So like, okay, I had to tell you one was positive and one was negative here so that you know they attract. Okay, that means I know Q1 is being pulled east and Q2 is being pulled west. So I know that because they're opposite. Okay, so, but when I do the formula, I never put the sign in, like I said, I never put the sign in. Don't put the negative sign in. We already know it's east. So we've already factored in that positive and negative sign when we decided, okay, so that's what we did here, is we knew it was east because we looked at it and we knew it was an attractive force. But then in the formula, don't put the negative sign in. Okay, never, never, ever do that. Okay, so I'm trying to be as emphatic as I can about that. That'll, that'll confuse the heck out of you if you start putting the signs in. Now I'm saying it, somebody in class, I don't know who, is still going to do it. They're still going to put the negative signs in, get the wrong answer, and then ask me for help about it. But please listen to what I'm saying. Use the formula to your heart's desire. Don't put signs in those formula, but positive and negative signs, please. Okay? You decide what the direction of the force is. That's easy. If they attract or repel, then use the formula without the signs, okay, to get the size of the force. You already know what the direction is. You know it's east. All right. So, any questions? <laughs> That's funny. I feel like I'm in class. I was going to say any questions about this. But you're not really here, are you? I'm just recording this by myself in a room. So anyway, there, that's the lesson for today. I, I did want to show you that uh, sometimes component method shows up, so I, I better show you that. I have I tried to keep it to about 30 minutes. It's long enough, but look, um, <clears throat> let's do another example. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm not going to finish these questions for you. I'm just going to set them up. What if we had the same two charges, Q1 and Q2? like this. What if we know that they are the same distance apart? Let's keep everything the same. 1.5 meters. Okay, I'm just reminding myself. Okay, and uh, I'm going to make one small change though. I'm going to say Q1, same as before. What's What was Q1 before? 1.6 microcoulombs. All right, and the other one was 3.4. I'm going to say Q1 is positive 1.6 microcoulombs. I'm going to say Q2 I'm just going to make it positive. It's positive 3.4 microcoulombs. Notice the change. Like I, I'm doing this intentionally to make it similar to a textbook problem, which you'll see when you do the homework. Oh my goodness, I'm having a hard time writing. Micro, there, that's beautiful. Okay, negative or positive 3.4 microcoulombs. All right, now I'm going to put <clears throat> another charge in here. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter what you want to call it. I'm going to call it Q3. I'm going to put it somewhere on this line. Okay, actually, I, let me move it so it's not in the right place. Um, let me put it over here. So there's Q3. Now, I could say, I, I'm a, I could tell you what Q3 is. I could say, oh, it's seven microcoulombs. Okay, whatever. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to leave it as an unknown. <clears throat> but the question in the book goes like this. Where would you put a third charge so that it experiences a net zero electric force. Okay, so you've got these two charges separated by 1.5 meters. Could you put a third charge in the picture somewhere so that the force, the total electric force on it is zero? Okay, and um, there's a question like this in the textbook homework, and I know you're going to ask if I didn't tell you, so I'm going to call this distance here x. And I'm going to call that distance 1.5 minus x. You see what I did there? That's the distance from Q1 to Q3 is x, and from it's the rest of the distance to Q2. Okay. All right. 
Now I'm going to draw a free body diagram. I, I promised you I wouldn't do this question for you, so I'm just setting it up, of Q3. Because it's the guy with no force on it, right? So Q3 looks like this. There is a force, I'm going to call it F2. Let's say Q, let's make Q3 a negative charge. Okay, just for the heck of it, we'll say it's negative. It doesn't matter. It wouldn't change much of the question if we, if it was positive instead, we'd get the same answer, but let's just say it's negative. So that means F2 is going to attract it, like charge Q2 will attract that negative charge, but Q1 is going to attract it also. Okay? So... The free body diagram of charge number three, and we, by the way, we never put gravity or anything else in these pictures. The electric force on them is the overwhelming force that we're talking about. And plus, it's only asking us about electric force. Now, here's the deal. If the net force is zero, the acceleration is therefore zero. <coughs> well, then I'm going to make East positive. The net force is F2 minus F1, and it's zero. So what that tells us is, therefore, F1 equals F2. Now I'm going to, here's where I use the formula. K, Q1, Q3 over X squared equals K, Q2, Q3 over 1.5 minus X squared, like that. So that's the two electric forces. Now, why is Q3 on both sides? Well, it's because it's the one that I'm drawing the free body diagram of, right? So it's included in both formula. Um, that's going to cancel with that. Okay, my K is going to cancel also, so I don't even need to worry about that. Uh, 9 times 10 to the 9 factor. And uh, in fact, if you're really smart about it, the micro in microcoulombs, the 10 to the minus 6, those two 10 to the minus 6s will cancel too. Okay, a lot of stuff cancels. Do you have to use the quadratic formula to solve for x? The answer is no, because it's squared on both sides. You can take the square root of both sides, and that will take care of that squared for you. But basically, this boils down to 1.6, which is q1, right? over x squared equals 3.4 divided by 1.5 minus x squared, like that, okay? And then just, you can cross multiply. So 1.6 times 1.5 minus x squared equals 3.4 x squared. Take the square root of both sides. So it'd be like the root 1.6 times 1.5 minus x will equal the root of 3.4, can I just do it like that, times x? Um, yeah, and these are all just numbers now, so just group your like terms, solve it for x, and that is where you would place a third charge so it experiences no force between the other two. So what we would say is the electric field right there is zero, okay? Because like you're, you're in between two positive charges, so they're gonna pull in opposite directions. All right, so that's how you do a question like that. Now, sometimes, let me do one more example for you. Sometimes you use components. Your favorite, your very favorite thing, right? Components. Okay, so um, let's say I've got Q1, Q2, keep everything the same. So here's Q1, here's Q2, and this time I'm going to put Q3 down there, okay? I'm gonna make Q1 1.6 microcoulombs, Q2 3.4 microcoulombs, they're both positive. I'm gonna make Q3, let's make it negative, let's make it negative 7.2 microcoulombs. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Okay, I'm just making this up. All right, so we've got these three charges and I have to tell you their separation. Let's say that distance there between those two guys is four centimeters. Let's say this distance here is three centimeters, okay? And my, oops, I'm sorry, my finger touched that. All right, and the question is, what is the net force on Q3? 
Now, actually, we could ask about any of the charges, but we're only going to ask for one. Okay, what is the net force? Sometimes the textbook's annoying. It'll say, what's the net force on each charge? Well, that's a long question. Okay, but let's just take this one, um, <clears throat> you know, and we'll just ask it once. What's the If you can do it for Q3, you can do it for any of them. All right, now it's not really necessary to draw a free body diagram, but I'm going to draw it anyway because uh, it's our first time going through these things. All right, first of all, we see that Q3 is oppositely charged to Q1, and so that means that Q1 will attract it. Okay? Now, at the same time, Q2 is also oppositely charged to Q3, and so, whoops, I shouldn't have made it so long. And so Q2 also attracts charge number three. And here we can see that these uh, forces, one of them is off axis. So here we'll call this theta. Okay. And by the way, I'll, I'll do a little imaginary line for you here. Okay. So that is theta there. And I'm just going to tell you a couple of things. Sokotoa, right? So sine of theta would equal opposite over hypotenuse. And it's a 3, 4, 5. So this is 5 centimeters here. Okay. So sine of theta would be 4 over 5. Cos of theta would be 3 over 5. And since our components use sine and cos, that's all we have to worry about. Um, here, I'm going to draw my two components. Uh, this vector F2 is off axis, so it has a component like that, and it has another component like this. That one is, goes with sine, and the red one here goes with cos. Okay, and so we use our component method, and actually, not even, oh, I just keep doing that, not even a word of a lie, you make your little table. Okay. Like I said, everyone's favorite thing, right? Uh, let's go with, uh, we know it's going to be north and east, so let's go with that, okay? All right, so now what you do is um, you're going to use your formula to decide how big these forces are, okay? So first of all, F1 is going to be KQ1, Q2 divided by R1 squared, okay? And this is R1, it's the distance between Q3 and Q1. And I'm sorry, I already made a slight error. That should be a three, okay? Okay, so now I just uh, plug the numbers in. So that's nine times 10 to the nine times 1.6 times 10 to the negative six times, uh, what did I say, 7.2 times 10 to the negative six, notice no negative sign, right? Now here's the deal, I don't just put in three for the distance, I put 0 0.03 squared. Why? Because you convert, okay, to meters. That was a long video. Anyway, I wanted to show you all the examples. Okay, so um, I'm gonna actually do this. I said I wouldn't do this question for you, I'm not gonna do all of it, but I'll do some of it, okay? So I go nine exponent nine, times 1.6 exponent 6 negative times 7.2 exponent 6 negative equals divided by 0 0.03 squared. And I actually get 115.2 newtons. So that's how big that force is. Okay. Now my other force, F2, long story short, it's going to be 9 times 10 to the 9 times one, sorry, no, it's not one, it's 3.4 times 10 to the negative six times 7.2 times 10 to the negative six divided by 0 0.05 squared. That is our two, right? Okay, and long story short, let's do it, nine exponent nine times 3.4 exponent 6 negative times 7.2 exponent 6 negative equals divided by 0 0.05 squared and I got 88.13 newtons okay 
All right, so now I know how big F1 and F2 are. But now I'm not done the question. I have to now do my components. So now I go back to my chart, okay? And I say, okay, so my how many north vectors do I have? Well, F1 is due north, right? And so that's 115.2. So F1 is 115.2 newtons north and zero newtons east. But F2, okay, the north component of it is this red vector. So I have to go 88.13 times the cos of theta. That's equal to 88.13 times 3 over 5. See what I did there? That's the cos of theta. Clever, right? All right, so that's F2. Now, on this side, I'm going to get 88.13 times the sine of theta. So that's 88.13. That's the blue vector, right? Times 4 over 5. See? Clever again. All right, now, here's the deal. Our goal is to find the net force. So what do you do? Well, you add them up and then use your component method. I'm not going to finish that for you. Okay, but suffice to say, sometimes we use component method. All right, so that's a pretty long lesson for today. So I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, I'm going to upload these on a Sunday because uh, tomorrow I'm kind of busy with some very annoying work. So anyway, I won't have time or a chance tomorrow, very likely. So I'm going to do this here today. Uh, but have a good couple of days, guys. And in, by Wednesday, I'm going to post another lesson. Okay, on the next thing. So if you have any questions, try to get this homework done in the next couple of days. And this homework is that. That's all. Okay? Page 330, page 335. I know you'll have questions for me. Some of these are a little new. Okay? So I did the best I could here. Enjoy that, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay?